Welcome to today's Law of Self-Defense show. I am, of course, attorney Andrew Branca for Law of Self-Defense. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So today's show will be, again, like yesterday's show was, about the federal Second Amendment case, U.S. v. Rahimi. Uh, yesterday, we read the Fifth Circuit three-panel judge decision in which they found that stripping a American citizen of their Second Amendment rights simply because of a domestic restraining order in the absence of any showing of dangerousness was an unconstitutional infringement of that person's Second Amendment rights. Rahimi is now heading to the U.S. Supreme Court. It's been appealed up to the U.S. Supreme Court where more argument will be heard on this legal question. That's what we read yesterday was the Fifth Circuit unanimous decision finding these domestic protection orders, uh, stripping you of your Second Amendment rights in the absence of dangerousness to be unconstitutional infringements of the Second Amendment. So this is the amicus brief we'll be reading today, uh, in part because it's got great substance on the merits, wonderful arguments made in here in support of the Second Amendment, but also because it was written by two people you ought to know at least by reputation. One of them is attorney David Koppel. David Koppel has for my entire adult life been a giant in defense of the Second Amendment. One of the greats, without question, he's at the Independence Institute right here in Denver, Colorado, not too far from me, although I don't I don't believe I've ever met attorney Koppel. Uh, and a co-author here is Consta Moros, who's an attorney with Michel and Associates, I believe is the correct pronunciation. Um, I've had the chance to have Consta on law self-defense, show as a guest um, and communicated quite a bit with him on Twitter. And he's, he's just a super sharp guy. Uh, Chuck Mitchell, the senior partner at Mitchell and Associates, is also the president of the California Rifle and Pistol Association, a 501c3 charitable organization that fights for Second Amendment rights at both the state level in California and in the federal level, all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court does great work there. So, these are the authors of this brief that we'll be covering today. And without, with that introduction out of the way, let's go ahead and formally launch the start of the show. Okay, before we jump into the heat of the matter, I am obliged, of course, to mention the sponsor of today's show, which is none other than CCW Safe. So CCW Safe is one of the numerous companies out there that are often mistakenly called self-defense insurance programs. They're not really insurance, but in general, what they do is they promise to cover your legal expenses and provide other benefits and services if you're involved in a use of force event. And those expenses can easily hit the hundreds of thousands of dollars, folks, especially in a killing case if you've had to kill in defense of yourself, your family, or your property, and you're facing a charge of murder or manslaughter. Uh, six digits above a million dollars is not unheard of for these self-defense cases at criminal trial. CCW Safe covers you for that. Now, I said there are a bunch of companies that purport to offer this kind of service. Um, CCW Safe is the only one that I would consider recommending, and it's the only one I'm personally a member of that I trust to protect myself and my family in the context of these tremendous legal expenses that can occur. If you'd like to learn why CCW Safe is the only one of these companies that I trust, well, I'll tell you. You just have to point your browser to lawofselfdefense.com slash trust. And there's a very brief two, three minute video there in which I outline the many reasons why, to my mind, CCW Safe is the only provider of the self-defense legal coverage services that serious people should consider. That's lawofselfdefense.com slash trust. All right, last thing before we dive into the reading of uh, this amicus curiae. And uh, incidentally, I'll mention that you'll, you'll see that um, when we dive into the meat of the reading, I'll have a different shirt on tie on. I pre-recorded the reading a few days ago and I'm just doing the post-production on it now, including this intro uh, and, and the exit from the video. Um, but if you're not familiar with Rahimi, I guess I would tell you to go watch yesterday's show in which we covered the Fifth Circuit decision on Rahimi. But I'll give you a, just in a nutshell for those of you who don't have time to watch yesterday's show right now as well. 
The federal case of U.S. v. Rahimi, uh, currently working its way to the Supreme Court, that's what this amicus curiae brief is for, friend of the court brief is for, involves the question of whether a presumptively law-abiding American citizen can be denied their Second Amendment rights when they are constrained by a domestic violence restraining order. Importantly, and also in the absence of any finding of dangerousness on behalf of the person constrained by the order. Now, although gun control propagandists will argue that Rahimi is about giving guns to domestic abusers, in fact, Second Amendment advocates readily agree the Second Amendment rights can be denied to people demonstrated to be dangerous. It is the absence of any showing of dangerousness that is key to Rahimi. Today's show is a, a reading of this amicus curiae brief, uh, again, by Constamoros, attorney Constamoros and attorney David Koppel. Uh, I think you'll really, really enjoy it. And again, yesterday's show, and I'll cross link these in the description, uh, was the reading of the Fifth Circuit three judge unanimous decision that found that in fact, it is an unconstitutional of, unconstitutional infringement of the Second Amendment to deny someone their Second Amendment rights on the grounds of a civil domestic violence restraining order in the absence of any showing of dangerousness. With that out of the way, let's dive into the reading of this amicus curiae brief. All right, folks, let's jump in. In the Supreme Court of the United States, U.S. v. Zaki Rahimi, this is the brief of the amicus curiae professors of Second Amendment Law, the Second Amendment Law Center, and the Independence Institute in support of respondent and affirmance. And the authors here are none other than Consta Moros, who's been interviewed on Law of Self-Defense, a lawyer with Michael and Associates, a California law firm that does great work in defending the Second Amendment, and David Koppel, who my entire adult life has been a giant in defense of the Second Amendment. Many, many written books, much legal work, much of it successful, just uh, simply humbling to uh, be reading an amicai by Moros N. Koppel. I'm going to skip past all the table of contents stuff and jump right into substantive section one here. Let me shift this over a little bit so it's easier for me to read. And here we go. Amicai Curi, Statement of Interest. Amakai law professors teach and or write on the Second Amendment. Randy Barnett, Robert Cottrell, Lee Francis, Donald Kilmer, Joyce Malcolm, George Moxery, Joseph Muha, Joseph Olson, Glenn Reynolds, and Gregory Wallace. Cited by this court in Heller and McDonald and oft cited by lower courts, these professors include authors of the first law school textbook on the Second Amendment and many other books and law review articles on the subject. The Second Amendment Law Center is a nonprofit corporation in Henderson, Nevada. The center defends the individual rights to keep and bear arms as envisioned by the founders. The Second Amendment Law Center also educates the public about the social utility of firearm ownership and provides accurate historical, criminological, and technical information to policymakers, judges, and the public. Founded in 1985 on the eternal truths of the Declaration of Independence, the Independence Institute is a 501c3 public policy research organization in Denver, Colorado. The briefs and scholarship of research director David Koppel have been cited in seven opinions of this court, including Bruin, McDonald, under the name of Lead Amicus International Law Enforcement Educators and Trainers Association, and Heller. Koppel has also been cited in 89 opinions of lower courts, The Institute's senior fellow in constitutional studies, law professor Robert Nadelson, has been cited in 11 opinions by justices of this Supreme Court. Next section, summary of argument. This brief addresses who may be deprived of the right to arms. Some lower courts have had difficulty discerning lessons to draw from historical laws disarming various groups. Constitutional enactments about the right to arms have added specificity to the right. When a constitutional enactment forbids depriving a particular group of the right to arms, the prior laws targeting that group are repudiated as legitimate precedents from which modern gun control analogies may be drawn. 
1689 English Bill of Rights, which is part of the British Constitution and was applicable in America, repudiated deprivation of arms rights because of peaceful political disagreement or because of adherence to a Protestant denomination that was not the established Church of England. The 1689 enactment allowed some restrictions based on economic or social class and did not protect non-Protestants. The 1788 United States Constitution rejected arms restrictions for persons whose religious scruples did not allow them to swear an oath. The 1791 Second Amendment rejected arms rights limitations based on religion or class or income. Therefore, the short-lived 1756 anti-Catholic laws in two colonies have no validity as post-1791 precedents for limitations on Second Amendment rights. The 1865 13th Amendment abolished all the badges and incidents of slavery. Being disarmed is an incident of being enslaved. Hence, the 13th Amendment obliterated the precedential value of earlier statutes forbidding slaves to have arms or allowing possession only with a discretionary license. All four clauses of Section 1 of the 1868 14th Amendment finished the work. Prior statutes imposing arms restrictions on free people of color were thereafter negated as precedents for arms restrictions. During the American Revolution, some loyalists still considered themselves subjects of the King of Great Britain and not the people of the United States. Textually, Second Amendment rights inhere only in the people of the United States. Similarly, when the Constitution was ratified, Indians were members of foreign nations. Their relations with the United States were governed by treaties ratified by the Senate. Later, Indians became citizens of the United States with the right to keep and bear arms. The colonial and early republic arms laws about Indians who were members of other nations are valid precedents today for arms laws applying to citizens of foreign nations. The precedents about members of foreign nations are not useful here because Mr. Rahimi is a U.S. citizen and hence one of the people of the United States. However, as accurately cataloged in the Solicitor General's brief, there is ample original meaning precedent for limiting an individual's arms rights based on a judicial finding that the person poses a danger to others. Therefore, state statutes addressing the same subject as 18 U.S.C. 922 G8CI can comply with the Second Amendment. While subsection CI requires finding of a credible threat, Subsection C2 does not, and therefore is an infringement. The problem could be solved by changing a single word between CI and C2, the word or, to the word and. Making CI and C2 conjunctive instead of disjunctive would remedy the infringement in C2. Next major section, argument, part one. Entitled, The Original Public Meaning of the Second Amendment is Not Infringed by Laws to Take Arms from Persons Proven to be Dangerous to Others. According to the petitioner, this court's statements about law-abiding responsible citizens means that a person's arms rights may be restricted if his possession of a firearm would pose a danger of harm to himself or others. Petitioner's conclusion regarding harm to others is supported by citations to common law and statutory offenses against carrying arms to terrify the public and to surety statutes, those are insurance statutes, for persons who carried arms in a manner threatening to breach the peace. Additional support comes from cited commentary from 1840 through 1868. Regarding persons who pose a danger to others, Amakai agree that such laws do not infringe the Second Amendment. Amakai will address the who of disarmament, which is part of the why. This brief takes no position on how. That is, whether the 922 G8 ban on firearms possession is analogous to the particular restrictions that historic laws imposed on dangerous people. Petitioner's emphasis on danger is a welcome departure from positions in other cases involving as-applied challenges by individuals who are plainly not dangerous. While petitioner's point about dangerousness is correct, 
Some of petitioner sites are inapt, including the 1662 Militia Act of wicked King Charles II. In the American view, the right to arms was trampled underfoot by Charles II and his two wicked sons and successors. Petitioner misunderstands the parliamentary debate following the 1780 Gordon riots in London. No one denied the proprietary of confiscating firearms from rioters. The debate involved General Amherst's alleged order, which he denied, to take guns carried by defensive neighborhood patrols who continued after the riot had been suppressed. Petitioner's citation to California's 1855 law about greasers is unpersuasive. Greaser was applied contemptuously to Mexican-Americans, some of whom greased wagon axles or animal hides. The precedential value of the Greaser Act was erased by the 14th Amendment, as explained below. Likewise questionable is petitioner citation to an 1874 New York Times article about drunken loafers. This citation, like others to the late 19th century, is at most marginally relevant. Petitioner citations to 20th century law tells us nothing about the original meaning of the Second Amendment. Subsection A, entitled, While Petitioner's Amici Rely on Invidious Discrimination, Constitutional Enactments Repudiate Such Discrimination for Arms Rights. Petitioner's brief does not rely on slave codes, in contrast to petitioner's briefing below. Several of petitioners' amici do try to convert long-rejected, invidious discrimination into modern constitutional precedent. These briefs overlook the arms-related constitutional enactments repudiating the invidious laws. The right to arms is governed by constitutional enactments and not by abuses the enactments were designed to stop. As legal historian Sir Henry Maine observed, The movement of the progressive societies has hitherto been a movement from status to contract. Similarly, the progress of the right to arms has been constitutional enactments to repudiate unjust exclusions. Subsubsection 1, the 1689 English Bill of Rights. In the American legal tradition, the progress began with the 1689 English Bill of Rights. Previously, the wicked Stuart monarchs had attempted to disarm political dissidents and to disarm persons who did not adhere to the established Church of England. The English Bill of Rights declared that the subjects which are Protestants may have arms for their defense suitable to their conditions and as allowed by law. As a result, the English government stopped enforcing an abusive portion of the 1662 Militia Act. The act's text ordered confiscation of arms from the dangerous or the disaffected. After 1689, the act was only enforced against the dangerous. Peaceful political disagreement was no longer grounds for arms confiscation. The protection of the rights of all Protestants, regardless of denomination, did not apply to England's small Catholic minority. A statute enacted the same year as the Bill of Rights allowed arms for Catholics who swore a loyalty oath denying papal authority in England or for those who would not swear, if a justice of the peace granted them a license. The language suitable to their conditions could be interpreted to allow class or economic discrimination. Thus, an 1870 English statute required persons carrying handguns off their property to purchase a non-discretionary annual 10-shilling tax stamp at the post office. The tax stamp, equivalent to about $84 today, burdened Poor people. American colonial charters guaranteed that Americans would have all the rights of Englishmen, and they also guaranteed a written right that the people in England did not have the perpetual right to import arms. In the American colonies, no enactments discriminated against keeping or bearing arms on the basis of income. Religious discrimination for arms was rare, but not non existent. In 1637, long before the 1689 Bill of Rights protected arms rights for all Protestants, theocratic Massachusetts Bay Colony issued an ex parte decree with no due process, disarming 17 antinomian followers of Anne Hutchinson. In 1643, Virginia, the royal governor imprisoned, disarmed, and banished 118 recent Puritan immigrants. They moved to Maryland. 
After an attempted assassination of King William III in England in 1696, the royal governor of New York confiscated the firearms of all 10 Catholic men in the colony. At the beginning of the French and Indian War in 1756, the royal governor of New Jersey, in defiance of the rights of the subjects which are Protestants, confiscated firearms from Moravians, a Protestant pacifist denomination who owned hunting guns. The governor called the Moravians snakes and likely wanted their guns for the colony's militia. Also in 1756, Pennsylvania confiscated papist arms to distribute to the militia. Virginia did the same. If a person would not sign an oath, his arms would be taken, except those necessary for the defense of his house or person. Subsection 2, titled the 1791 Second Amendment. According to James Madison's notes for his speech introducing the Bill of Rights in the United States House of Representatives, the English Bill of Rights had numerous defects. Among them was the limitation of arms to Protestants. Even if the First Amendment's free exercise clause had never been enacted, the Second Amendment, by its own force, forbids religious discrimination in arms rights. For example, a post-9-11 law to disarm Muslim citizens of the United States would have been a Second Amendment infringement. Madison also chose to omit the 1689 English text about conditions. In the decades before and after the Second Amendment, American laws did not restrict arms rights based on wealth. As the Tennessee Supreme Court stated regarding the state constitution, the English Bill of Rights conditions were abrogated. All free citizens have the right, without any qualification whatever, as to their kind and nature. It is true that in the late 19th century, some Jim Crow states enacted laws of overt economic discrimination with a subtext of discrimination against freedmen and poor whites. Tennessee and Arkansas outlawed sale of handguns other than the Army and Navy types. The military-style handguns were the best-made, most expensive, largest, highest capacity, and most powerful. Many former Confederate officers already owned them. Poor people of any race could not necessarily afford such an excellent arm. After incidents in which blacks used repeating rifles to deter lynch mobs, Florida in 1893 imposed a $100 bond, over $3,000 today, for a license to carry around with him on his person and in his manual possession a Winchester rifle or other repeating rifle. The law was extended to handguns in 1901. Florida Supreme Court Justice Rivers Buford had been a state representative in the legislative session that passed the handgun provision. Later, in a 1941 opinion, he disapprovingly pointed out that the license law violated the Second Amendment and its Florida analog and was never intended to apply to the white population and in practice has never been so applied, for it has been generally conceded to be in contravention of the Constitution and non-enforceable if contested. The few examples of economic discrimination from the late 20th century do not overcome the textual removal of English conditions in the American Bill of Rights. Bruin properly noted the illegality of exorbitant fees for carry permits. Sub-sub-section 3, the 1865 13th Amendment. The original Constitution did not attempt to abolish slavery. Instead, it authorized Congress to forbid the importation of slaves starting in 1808. As the founders understood, disarmament is a necessary condition for slavery. They defined slavery broadly. To them, slavery included chattel slavery as practice against Africans and Indian captives and also political systems based on arbitrary will rather than consent. Either way, to be disarmed is to subject to the arbitrary will of another, to be enslaved or enslavable. If slaves had a right to arms, they would not be slaves for long. The venerated English martyr of liberty, Algernon Sidney, wrote, He is a fool who knows not that swords were given to men, that none might be slaves, but such as know not how to use them. Thomas Jefferson called Sidney, Aristotle, Cicero, and John Locke, the four major sources of the American consensus on the rights and liberty which Jefferson distilled into the Declaration of Independence. 
When King George III in 1768 put Boston under military occupation, the city's government urged Bostonians to arm themselves. Samuel Adams agreed. The English Bill of Rights had been enacted because of the wicked Stuarts, bigoted to the greatest degree to the doctrines of slavery, and regardless of the natural, inherent, divinely, hereditary, and indefeasible rights of their subjects. Pursuant to the 1689 Bill of Rights, as expounded by Blackstone, there is a right to arms at any time, but more specifically for self-preservation against the violence of oppression. Patrick Henry, too, equated disarmament with slavery, as in his famous speech. But when shall we be stronger? Will it be when we are totally disarmed and when a British guard shall be stationed in every house? There is no retreat, but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged. Their clanking may be heard on the plains of Boston. Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. In the same spirit, the Declaration of Independence affirmed that Americans are, with one mind, resolved to die free men rather than live slaves. American state constitutions and state conventions declared the doctrine of non-resistance against arbitrary power and oppression is absurd, slavish, and destructive of the good and happiness of mankind. The American Revolution's Novus Ordo Seclorum produced changes not foreseen when the revolution began. If all men are created equal, then slavery is invalid. Starting in the 1780s, the Declaration of Independence became a moral center of abolitionism in the United States. Abolitionist constitutionalism relied in part on the Second Amendment. According to Joel Tiffany, reporter for the New York Court of Appeals and author of Legal Treatises, here is another of the immunities of a citizen of the United States which is guaranteed by the supreme organic law of the land. It is accorded to every subject for the purpose of protecting and defending himself, if need be, in the enjoyment of his absolute rights to life, liberty, and property. And this guarantee is to all, without any exception. For there is none, either expressed or implied. It is hardly necessary to remark that this guarantee is absolutely inconsistent with permitting a portion of our citizens to be enslaved. The colored citizen under our Constitution has now as full and perfect a right to keep and bear arms as any other, and no state law or state regulation has authority to deprive him of that right. But there is another thing implied in this guarantee, and that is the right of self-defense. For the right to keep and bear arms also implies the right to use them, if necessary, in self-defense. Without this right, to use the guarantee would have been hardly been worth the paper it consumed. Or, as abolitionist Lysander Spooner wrote in 1845, the Second Amendment obviously recognizes the natural right of all men to keep and bear arms for their personal defense and prohibits both Congress and the state governments from infringing the right of the people, that is, of any people, to do so. Among the incidents of slavery was, he is not allowed to keep or carry firearms. Therefore, when the 13th Amendment declared neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States, the badges and incidents of slavery were likewise outlawed. Following the ratification of the amendment, Horace Greeley, the newspaper editor, abolitionist, and later 1872 presidential nominee of the Democratic and Liberal Republican parties, argued in a speech, the moment slavery had passed away, all possible pretexts for disarming Southern blacks passed away with it. Our federal constitution gives the right to the people everywhere to keep and bear arms, and every law whereby any state legislature undertakes to contravene this, being in conflict with the constitution of the United States, has no longer any legal force. Ever since 1865, the arms provisions of the slave codes have been analogous for what is forbidden by our constitutional right to arms. Sub subsection 4, the 1868 14th Amendment. The 13th Amendment notwithstanding, many former slave states attempted to keep freedmen in de facto servitude, including by thwarting their Second Amendment rights. Quoting MacDonald, Black veterans returning home were considered dangerous, and disarming them was a priority for the white supremacists of the defeated Confederacy. 
There is an ironic similarity between the claims made by Southern whites then and the argument made by gun control proponents today. Sheriffs and white posses raided black homes to seize illegal guns and declared such seizures were not infringements of blacks' Second Amendment rights to possess guns as part of a militia. As Frederick Douglass explained, the legislatures of the South can take from him the right to keep and bear arms as they can. They would not allow a Negro to walk with a cane where I came from. Notwithstanding the provision in the Constitution of the United States that the right to keep and bear arms shall not be abridged, the black man has never had the right either to keep or bear arms. Absent the constitutional amendment to enforce that right against the states, the work of the abolitionists is not finished. Keep no man from the ballot box or jury box or the cartridge box because of his color. Before the Civil War, slave states had also targeted free people of color. For example, in 1840, North Carolina statute forbade any free Negro, mulatto, or free person of color to possess or carry arms without a license. The state Supreme Court admitted the statute would be unconstitutional if applied to whites. However, free people of color have been among us as a separate and distinct class, requiring from necessity in many cases separate and distinct legislation. Such reasoning was multiply forbidden by Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. First, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. Thus, the amendment overturned Dred Scott's theory that free people of color are not American citizens and hence could be forbidden to keep and carry arms wherever they went. Second, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privilege or immunities of citizens of the United States. The language was specifically intended to protect Second Amendment rights for all citizens, not only militiamen. Third, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. The clause forbade certain government actions, including bans on keeping and bearing arms, because some statutes are necessarily not law in the American sense, namely ordered liberty. And fourth, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. The Equal Protection Clause recognizes a duty of state governments to protect the rights of all persons by effectively enforcing its laws without discrimination. Because of the clause, after 1868, legislatures intent on racial discrimination in arms laws wrote those laws without specific reference to race. We, the people of the United States, govern most supremely by constitutional enactment. By such enactments, we the people have abolished many infringements of the right to keep and bear arms. Those infringements today are analogs for types of laws that the constitutional right to arms forbids, not the types of laws that it allows. Sub subsection 5 Indians. Some amici. The United States and some lower courts and some lower courts have pointed to colonial period or early republic laws against arms sales to Indians. These are irrelevant to the case at bar because they involved the citizens of other nations. The Constitution created by we, the people of the United States, did not purport to establish a system of government and rights for the people of France or of the Cherokee Nation. Instead, Congress was simply given power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and with Indian tribes. When the United States was in friendly relations with a foreign nation or an Indian tribe, their agreements were treaties ratified by the Senate. To the extent that Congress chose, it could regulate trade with non-American nations, whether Indian or overseas. Regulation of trade with foreigners does not infringe the Second Amendment rights of foreigners because foreigners are not the people. For example, today, a Russian cannot claim that his Second Amendment rights are infringed because federal regulations prevent him from buying an American-made gun. In the years following 1787, the practical sovereignty of the Indian tribes was diminished. An 1871 statute declared that henceforth, no Indian nation or tribe within the territory of the United States shall be acknowledged or recognized as an independent nation, tribe, or power with whom the United States may contract by treaty. Laws recognized American citizenship 
of more and more Indians with citizenship for all in 1924. To the extent laws have infringed the arms rights of citizen Indians, they were unconstitutional ab initio. Historic laws regarding arms restrictions for non-citizens are relevant today. For example, foreigners visiting the U.S. on a tourist visa may only possess firearms if admitted to the United States for lawful hunting or sporting purposes, or is in possession of a hunting license or permit lawfully issued in the United States. The statute does not infringe the Second Amendment because foreign tourists are not included in the people of the United States. Citizenship analogies also inform analysis of the firearms prohibitions for a person who, having been a citizen of the United States, has renounced his citizenship. Citizenship analogies are not relevant to the Rahimi case because Mr. Rahimi is a citizen of the United States. That he is dangerous and unvirtuous does not make him a non-citizen, and therefore he is one of the people. Sub-subsection 6. Disloyalty in wartime. During the American Revolution, some state laws took arms from people who refused to swear loyalty to the United States. In wartime, disarmament is permissible for enemy combatants and for persons who have shown inclination to aid the enemy. For example, after the German surrender in World War II in May 1945, but before the Japanese surrender in September, some Germans in Japanese-occupied China continued to aid the Japanese army. This court rejected the claim that the Germans had a right to be tried by a civil court rather than a military tribunal. According to Justice Jackson's opinion for the court, granting the Germans Fifth Amendment rights would mean that during military occupation of territories formerly held by the Axis, irreconcilable enemy elements, guerrilla fighters, and werewolves could require the American judiciary to assure them freedoms of the right to bear arms as in the Second Amendment. During the American War of Independence, the anti-independence loyalists rejected being the people of the United States. They fought to remain subjects of the King of Great Britain. The Second Amendment is not infringed by wartime disarmament of individuals who choose to exclude themselves from the people. In the Revolutionary Period, some Americans bearing true faith and allegiance to the United States were unwilling to swear an oath. Jesus had said, swear not at all. The wrongful disarmament of religiously scrupulous, non-swearing citizens was repudiated by the Constitution. The president-elect shall take the following oath or affirmation. I do solemnly swear or affirm. Because the commander-in-chief and other officials may choose affirmation instead of oath, citizens with similar scruples may not be disarmed. Subsection 7. Conclusion. The analogical validity of old laws does not depend on modern judges' moral analysis. Instead, constitutional enactments control. Although some old gun controls were the fruit of poisonous trees, we the people, by our constitutional enactments, have removed those trees, root and branch. The enactment of 1689, 1788, 1791, 1865, and 1868 ended all validity of bigoted gun control laws. Today, those laws are analogs for types of gun control that are forbidden. In contrast, historic gun control laws based on citizenship remain proper analogs for modern laws. Sub sub section B titled Synthesis of Disarmament Precedents. The disarmament precedents that have not been repudiated by constitutional enactments have two broad categories. The first is a group standard, and the second an individual one. The existence of two standards is not surprising, because the Second Amendment is about sometimes bearing arms in a group, such as the militia, a sheriff's posse comitatus, or a hunting party, and sometimes individually, such as for defense in one's automobile. After London's 1780 Gordon riots, the recorder of London, the city attorney, affirmed that the defense of neighborhood patrols were an exercise of the right to arms. That right, which every Protestant most unquestionably possesses individually, may, and in many cases must, be exercised collectively. 
Just as the right is necessarily sometimes exercised collectively and sometimes individually, the limitations of the right will sometimes be collective and sometimes individual. Collectively, an absence of Second Amendment rights arises from not being among the people. Individually, Second Amendment rights may be restricted based on specific behavior demonstrating danger to others. The dangerousness category draws no support from old laws about Catholics, free people of color, poor people, and the like. Although legislatures, kings, or other officials did consider these groups to be dangerous, the people, through constitutional enactments, have stricken such laws from being valid precedents for limiting our rights to arms. Sub Subsection C, titled Applying Law-Abiding Responsible Citizens. As petitioner states, disarmament of persons who are dangerous to others is consistent with this court's language about law-abiding citizens. The words are not meant to produce absurd results. A city council could not prohibit firearms possession by someone convicted of overtime parking, even if the council made the crime punishable by up to three years in jail, and even if the person were convicted a hundred times. Likewise, Law-abiding citizens should not be construed as implicitly overruling United States v. Verdugo or Quaidez, which stated that the people safeguarded by the Bill of Rights, including the Second Amendment, includes persons who have developed substantial connections with this country. The category surely includes non-citizens who have been granted lawful permanent residency. Subsection 2. The Defects of Section 922 G8. The decision below should be affirmed because a single word in 922 G8 makes it facially unconstitutional. The statute bans firearms possession based on two different types of court orders. C1 includes a finding that such person represents a credible threat to the physical safety of such intimate partner or child. Or two by its terms explicitly prohibits the use, attempted use, or threatened use of physical force against such intimate partner or child that would reasonably expect it to cause bodily injury. Because paragraph CI requires a judicial finding of dangerousness, it does not infringe the Second Amendment. Subsection paragraph C2 does not require such a finding of dangerousness and is an infringement. Judicial orders that acrimonious domestic parties not do something illegal in the future is not equivalent to a judicial finding that there is a credible threat of illegal behavior. Congress could easily fix the problem by changing the or at the end of paragraph C1 to and. Alternatively, subsection C2 could be severed. Amicus California Legislative Women's Caucus attempts to rescue C2, saying it is used when the subject of the order has a history of threats or violence, or there is other credible evidence that violence may occur. If C2 were so worded, it would be similar to C1 and not an infringement. Because C2 is so open-ended, it encompasses mutual protective orders that infringe the Second Amendment by disarming victims. Unlike federal law, California has specific protections against inappropriate issuance of mutual orders. The Second Amendment aside, Section 922G8 is still constitutionally dubious. The connection to congressional power to regulate commerce among the several states is even weaker than the gun-free school zone statute previously held unconstitutional. Indeed, the statute in Lopez exempted the home and other private property, whereas G8 does not. Some of the Section 922G prohibitions are well grounded in the Interstate Commerce Clause. Quote, to ship or transport in interstate or foreign commerce. Close quote. Another prohibition, to receive any firearm or ammunition which has been shipped or transported in interstate or foreign commerce, has a distant connection to interstate commerce by involving a property transfer. The prohibition, possess in or affecting commerce, as read by petitioner to encompass mere possession of a gun that once crossed the state line, is far disconnected from the power to regulate commerce among the several states. When Congress acts beyond its enumerated powers, federal-state comedy is injured. Federal courts do not exist to adjudicate state domestic relations cases. 
Since the birth of the union, it is the individual states that have held the power to enact laws for the good and welfare of their citizens, including those laws providing for protective orders. Based on evidence in particular cases, state judges sometimes issue orders that a domestic party not possess a firearm. In contrast, G8 can make a state court order have a legal effect that the state judge declined to impose. Thus, a state is denied the ability to impose certain restrictions on persons without also prohibiting their firearms rights. Subsection 3, titled Amicus Briefs. This court's opinions affirmed the freedom of speech for over a century before the court actively began protecting it. As judicial engagement progressed, the court had to develop increasingly sophisticated free speech doctrines. When doing so, the court did not rely on theories propounded by persons who considered the freedom of speech pernicious and who wanted to shrink the broad right to microscopic size. In the instant case, some of petitioners amici also filed briefs in Heller, McDonald, and Bruin. These cases affirmed elementary, obvious points about the Second Amendment. It is a normal individual right. It is applied to the states by the 14th Amendment, and it is not contingent on an individual's special need. In all three cases, some of the present amici attempted to persuade this court to render the Second Amendment a nullity. Such amici include New York City, Chicago, the state of Illinois, several of the religious leaders and organizations, and various gun control groups. Organizations that believe a right should not exist are not the best guides for the proper interpretation of that right, just as a dissenting opinion is generally not the best source of legal advice on how to comply with the majority opinion. Amicus Patrick Charles offers to educate the court about Bruin. He believes that Bruin fails to adhere to even basic academic standards and that it did not invoke history honestly or honorably. He accuses Justice Thomas, and assuredly many others of the bench and bar, of selectively invoking the authoritative power of history in a manner that justifies their own predilections. According to Charles, Begazi means that the Second Amendment, at least as articulated by Bruin, is historically ruined and fake. Mr. Charles' proposed macro approach amounts to interest balancing. For at a high enough level of generality, everything is similar in some infinite ways to everything else. This court correctly requires analogs that, while not historical twins, are relevantly similar. Petitioners amici, professors of history and law, include some, most notably Professor Sol Cornell, whose theories were rejected by the majority and cited by the dissents in Heller and MacDonald and Bruin. In Professor Cornell's view of Bruin, Thomas has taken law office history to a new low, even for the Supreme Court, a body whose special brand of law chambers history has prompted multiple critiques and been a source of amusement for generations of scholars and court watchers. Bruin was, quote, tendentious, error-filled, and highly selective culling of evidence, and a new low for the court. The bizarro constitutional universe inhabited by Thomas is bonkers, close quote. Professor Cornell denounces Quote, Thomas, Alito, and their ideological co-conspirators and the surreal originalist universe inhabited by Thomas and his colleagues. Close quote. Having perpetrated a, quote, historical charade, close quote, Justice Gorsuch and Barrett are ideological warriors and political hacks. That's Professor Saul Cornell. More politely, Professor Jack Rakoff adheres to his understanding that the entire point of the Second Amendment was to secure the status of the state militias in response to the militia clause in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. No one at the time thought it had anything to do with constitutionalizing a common law concept of self-defense, close quote. Although Professor Rakov is sincere and eminent, he's not a reliable guide to interpreting a meaningful Second Amendment. Bruin should be overturned declares a brief from a senator who previously sent this court a threat letter in the form of an amicus brief. The Second Amendment law scholars complain that Bruin's historical test is too hard to apply because some lower courts have disagreed on particular issues. But lower courts also sometimes disagreed in the now discarded two-step test. 
Moreover, step one of the old test, which many courts have been applying since Heller, is broadly consistent with the original meaning test adopted by Heller and affirmed by Bruin. Bruin simply offers lower courts guidance for legal history analysis. Conclusion Laws that were repudiated by subsequent constitutional enactments do not justify modern gun control laws. Such laws are analogs for identifying modern infringements of the right to arms. Some valid historic laws are proper analogs for restricting arms rights of individuals who have been found by a court to be dangerous to others. Although the current version of 18 U.S.C. section 922 G8 is not such a law, it easily could be if or were changed to and after section 922 G8C1. The judgment below should be affirmed. Respectfully submitted David B. Koppel, Independence Institute, 727 East 16th Avenue, Denver, Colorado, 80203. Council of Record. Well written, sir. Well written. And on the cover page of this, because he provided considerable uh, support and assistance, is Constantinos Moros of Mitchell and Associates, Consta has been a guest on our show before, as I've mentioned, and I'm sure he had great fun working with Dave Koppel on this amicus brief to the U.S. Supreme Court in U.S. v. Rahimi. All right, folks, that's it for my reading of the amicus curiae brief by attorneys David Koppel and attorney um, Consta Moros. I hope you really enjoyed that. They both do great work. With that, I will remind you, if you carry a gun, so you're hard to kill. If you carry a knife, so you're hard to kill. If you carry pepper spray, so you're hard to kill. If you practice jujitsu, so you're hard to kill. I do all those things, so I am hard to kill. So my family is hard to kill. Then you also owe it to yourself and your family to make sure you know the law, so you're hard to convict as well. Until next time, I remain attorney Andrew Branca for Law of Self-Defense. Stay safe.